Revelation knowledge is something not that you know in your head, but that you see clearly in your spirit. One, that's one of the features. Second feature is that it becomes so, you, you know it so much, it, so, it's so compelling, it moves you to action. That's one of the other characteristics of revelation. So you must, um, so this action to the point where um, it becomes a reality as much as you know your name. If someone tells me my name is not Yemi Adelaide, I'll just, do, is that really gonna make me fight? No, it's probably just gonna make me laugh at them and walk away because that's how certain that I am. That's how certain I am that that's me. That's my name. Sometimes the reason why we actually even um, fight is because we are not sure of our identity enough. Because when you know who you really are in Christ, the devil cannot no longer dominate you. He cannot define you with an, a certain identity of what you're not. You're just probably gonna walk away that this is just a joke because that's how sure and certain you are. So the, the things we know that the word of God says to us that we know in the world must move from just mere information to revelation and to renew your mind uh, changing by changing how you think it, it, it's, it's to renew your mind. You just, we've talked about this before. It's changing how you think, not just what you think. Uh, how you think can't change if you see, if how you see yourself does not change. Because being in, in Christ is not all about, this is what I do. I now do this and I, I don't do that anymore. I do this, no. It's about who I now am. It's about being, not doing. So all mind renewal starts, begins with the right sense of identity. That's where I'm going. I said all of that to say this. All mind renewal begins with a right sense of identity. There's a difference between, for instance, a, a worldly and a godly mind. Possessing a godly mind requires us to live in a worldly environment with a godly perspective. So we are living in a worldly environment with a godly perspective. So renew your mind then is all about seeing things the way God sees it. First of all, seeing yourself the way you, you the way God sees you. <laughs> Glory to God. For it's fundamental to seeing things the way God sees it is seeing yourself the way God sees you because then it automatically renews your lenses. It changes your lenses. <laughs> the lens through which you look at other things and to look at other people. Paul says, "Be not, brethren, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's saying be transformed and not be conformed to what we see around, but what we see within us, not what we see without. Mm. So he's calling us to be transformed in the context of what we see within, not what we see without. But then it means there's a problem if I can't see within because I'm only just going to automatically gravitate towards what I see without. Because then all I have to, all I'm going to depend on for my sense of identity is what I see around me. This is the problem with many of us Christians, children of God. This change is about what I see within me, not what I see around me. So I, I, I got to go by what I see within or else what I see around is going to overpower me. Within me, I've got to see things right. The Bible says when a man is in Christ, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. So this sense of identity doesn't happen to us just 
by wishful thinking or just by uh, someone just, it's not like a, a spell that is cast on us and don't we, we, we just begin to live in it. We must be intentional about it. There is something I call, um, I call it thought audit, where I learn to audit my thoughts. Not just auditing my thoughts, but auditing my thinking process. <laughs> Being transformed by the renewing of my mind involves auditing not just what I think, but how I think. A quote from a recent article that I read was talking about auditing. It says, um, for those being audited, fear is rooted in the, that the audit might find something. And on the other side, the auditor fears that he might not find something. If you've ever gone through an audit, you know what that means. The audited is afraid that the auditor might find something. The auditor is afraid that he might not find something that's important. So while the auditor is making sure he spends the right time keeping good records, spending right, the auditor is also making sure he improves his system to be able to pick up errors during his audit. In fact, it's a common practice. Sometimes the auditor, first of all, audits himself or his own system in order to be able to practice, to be able to audit others effectively. Many times, many of us are trying to audit others effectively without first auditing ourselves. And in this case, you are both the auditor and the audited. So this is not just about fixing your thoughts. It's about fixing your thinking. It's about fixing your thinking. Ask yourself, what, what's, because we've got, the Bible talks about that the weapons of our warfare, they're not cannot, but they, they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imagination and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I promise you in our minds all the time, there are thoughts that want to ex exalt themselves above the knowledge of God, above our revelation of God, above our sense of identity in Christ, above what who the word of God says we are. Those thoughts are kind of self-imposing. So then we have the responsibility to not allow the thoughts to overcome us. And the way we do it is by auditing our thinking process. We got to pay attention. If we don't, if we didn't have power over it, the Bible will not tell us, the Lord will not have told us in his word that we do have power over it. Because many times we just say, oh yeah, I couldn't help it. I was just thinking like that. And the thought, the thought came to mind, but I, and I, there was nothing I could do about it. We're not victims of our thoughts, brothers and sisters. We have been given power. So you got to begin to ask yourself, what is my thinking pattern? What are the common denominators and common trends I've noticed? Because how do we think? Usually one thing leads to the other. One, we've got to be able to identify the triggers of negative thinking. Of, and of negative thoughts. What have I found within my last few trends of thoughts? What the, the trends and the direction of my thoughts, what, what do the trends and the direction of my thoughts seem to take? What usually leads me to this thought? What usually leads me, what usually tri triggers this particular thought? And what does it usually lead to? What are the common features? Sometimes comparison. Comparison my, comparing myself with other people and taking an average measure and measure myself, score myself on, on the scale of how am I doing in comparison with them. Identity is not a relative term. What do I mean? I am not these, I'm not who I am because of who you are. So irrespective of who you are, I am who I am. Because if identity is a matter of relative term, then we will all just be like 
cars traveling on the road who have no speed limit and no, no, no dashboard and no speedometers. And all we do is to look at how people, other people are, how fast they are going to determine how fast we are going or how fast we want to go. So all the thoughts of acceptance and acknowledgement, rejection, whether I'm good enough or not good enough, what people think of me, how people perceive me, and all of that, thinking about myself through other people's minds. I cannot think about myself through the mind of another person. Whether I'm accepted or loved or, or not affirming myself or not affirming myself based on their thoughts. That's like relative identity. It means that whatever they think is what I am. And if they don't think good of me, then I'm not good enough. And if they think good of me, then I'm good enough. That particularly just hands the baton over to somebody else. It hands the steering wheel over to somebody else. So when you go through this and all of this, and you're gonna find out that most times it may seem like there's a lot to really fix, but it's just the bottom lines that need fixing. Most times it's just, look at it like this. Most times it's just one tree with several branches. And when you cut down, so let me say that again. Most times negative thinking is like one tree with its several branches. And when you cut down the tree, the branches will begin to dry out gradually. It may take a process, but they'll dry out. It may take weeks or months or years, but they'll dry out. But we've got to cut down the tree and make sure the tree remains cut down. It must be intentional. You got to go able to tell yourself, no, 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 no. We don't think like that. We don't do negative thinking. Catch it before it catches you. I tell myself, catch the ant. Ant being an acronym for automatic negative thinking. Because negative thoughts come like auto suggestion. You don't even have to try to think about them. They just appear. But you've got this, this, this all spans from the a right sense of identity, knowing who you are in Christ. You, the Bible says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, that's another in him scripture. I mean, I told you there, there's, there's, there's 135 or so, or so of them in him, in Christ, through Christ, through him, in him. All right, so this is another in him scripture. Second Corinthians 5, 21, I read it again. For he hath made him to be sin for us who need no sin that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Notice that he refers to you as the righteousness of God. It doesn't even say that's what you have. It says that's what you are. Wow. So you are the righteousness of God in this, your new identity, in this, your new nature, you are the righteousness of God personified. Wow. I think that's so amazing. <laughs> I think that ought to change how I see myself. I am the righteousness of God. It's not a title. It's not a honor conferred on you. You were born into it when you were born again. It was a rebirth. Your old self died and your new self was born again. Now you are born with a different DNA, with a different identity, with a different, uh, 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 with different genes in you, my God. How amazing is that? That ought to change how you see yourself. That ought to change how you see the world. That ought to change how you see people. That is, there is nothing better than that. It doesn't, it doesn't get better than that. My goodness, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You have always been uh, an Iabo since you were born. You're always going to be an Iabo. I've always been a Yemi since I was born. I've, I'm always going to be a Yemi. You've always been a Chica since you were born. You're always going to be a Chica. 
Uh, you've always been a Frank since you were born, Frank Garcia. You, it, you know that? That doesn't ever change. My goodness. You cannot be more Frank Garcia than you already are. That means that you cannot be more born into righteousness than you already are. You can grow in the knowledge of it, but That's not right. in it. That's right. You can grow in the understanding of it. That's, that's the best that could ever happen is for you to grow in the understanding of it, but not in it. Because I'm just as Yemi and liar as I can ever be. I cannot be a more legitimate son of my father anymore. I'm just as legitimate as I would ever, 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 ever be. My goodness. It's not a title. It's not something you earn. It was, it was given to you by birth my goodness it was given to you <clears throat> by genealogy my goodness the dna of christ flows right in you my god you see it's this is why it's interesting because then we're not trying to do something to attain something we are doing it because we already are that thing wow it's not something we're trying to attain. It's something we already are that the world is trying to tell us we're not. That's why the method of grace is totally the opposite of the method of legalism. Totally the opposite. With legalism, you earn it. You try harder and harder till you earn it. And then do the same to maintain it. With grace, God begins by giving it to you. By putting it on you, it puts you in union with Christ. Makes you one with Christ. Mm -hmm. And then as you begin to walk in it, you learn how to use it. That's a totally different concept. It's totally the opposite. Wow. With legalism, you earn it before you get it. Work hard, earn it before you get it. With grace, you get it before you learn it. Before you begin to learn how it works. You, you learn how it works after you get it. With legalism, we get it after we earn it. With grace, we learn it after we get it. Learning, it's, it's like learning how to wear a new piece of clothing that you've been given. It's already yours. The rest is okay. If I want to wear it, this is how I wear it. <laughs> it's like a new skating shoes you just got. You don't know how to skate yet, but yes, fine. It's yours already. My God. And the fact that you don't know how to skate doesn't mean that they're going to change their mind and take it away from you. It's been given to you. It grant, you see, this is how God does it. He grants you access first before you begin to learn and understand what you've been granted access into. Now, why does God use this recipe? The system, uh, why, why does he use this system and not the other way around where he makes you earn it before you get it, which was what the old covenant did. Both have different effects. That's why. With legalism, you suffer a lot before you get it, and when you do get it, you have a sense of ownership when you get it. You feel like you merited it when you get it. It comes with a feeling of merit. My God, which determines your attitude towards others. Your attitude towards others cannot be good because you're going to feel like they have to suffer what you suffer to get to where you are. You're not going to understand that not everybody grew up the way you grew up, and some things you know might be true under, true under some certain circumstances, but it may not be a recipe for others. Self-righteousness is the result of legalism. But the truth is, with grace on the other hand, you get it first. And you might not even appreciate it at first. You might not really know what you have at first. Praise God. How many people have been there? Thank you, Jesus. God doesn't mind because as you begin to learn and understand it, the more you would appreciate what you have and the more humble you become. It's humbling. My goodness. 
So God is not afraid to put his grace on you because he knows that as you begin to really understand what he has given you, you can only become more humble. So grace makes you grow from pride to humility. Legalism makes you grow from humility to pride. So with grace, the way up is down. And with legalism, the way down is up. With legalism, it may look like you're going up, but you're actually going down. And with grace, it may look like you're going down, but you're actually going up. Many times the ways of God is exactly the direct opposite of the ways of the world. When you humble yourself, what does he do? He lifts you up. My goodness. That's why he says, humble yourself under the hand of the mighty hand of the God that in due time and due season he may exalt you. If God was going to go the legalistic route, none of us will be qualified. <laughs> My goodness. And the method he uses is to pour his grace. <laughs> Good day, sir. <laughs> <laughs> to pour his grace on us first. My goodness. Thank you, Jesus. And then as we walk in it, Thank you, Jesus. One of the things he then teaches you is to be able to extend grace to others. That's right. Because you know how you got That's it. That's right. That's right. That's right. Wow. Because if you earned it on marriage, you worked hard to get it, you're going to make others work hard. Harder. You're going to make people work hard. And you, when they're suffering, you're going to always look at them and say, how much have you suffered? Do you know what I went through? Do you know how much I suffered? You need to suffer some more. But that's completely the opposite of how God does it. He, give us, he gives us this thing that we can never, ever walk enough to ever, ever be able to, to, to come to the place where we deserve. Wow. Wow. And the recipe always creates humility. If, you're not, if, it's not, if it's not bringing the fruit of humility, you're not using that recipe. You're doing something else. Because the, the knowledge of God doesn't puff you up. It, 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 it humbles you. Anybody who says they know God and they are proud because they know God and the more they think they know God, the, the more proud they are. Really? That's not the fruit of the knowledge of God. The more, the more people know God, the humble they become. The more humble they become. Praise God. Praise God. Does, has anybody, I just feel we should just take a moment and just celebrate the goodness of God right now in your life. Just give him praise. Just thank him. Just worship him. Just thank him for his grace that we didn't deserve it, yet he gave it to us. My goodness. What a great God, what a wonderful God, what a glorious God who, who reserves the best for his children and does not wait for us to qualify for it because if, if he ever waited, none of us would be qualified for it. Thank you, Father, we give you glory. Come on, just bless him. Let's wave our hands and thank him. I know you're driving, but just bless him, give him praise. He's good, his goodness is we are products of his goodness. We are products of his favor. We are good products, my, 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 of his kindness. My God, he has lavished his grace upon you. Wow, thank That's why many people look at you and feel you don't deserve to be where you are, that you're not, you're, you're not mo the most faithful of all men. You, you've done bad things, you've, you've, but God in his kindness, in his loving kindness, in his favor, in his goodness, We've made mistakes, but yet we're still standing. We've not been the most politically correct. Yeah. We've not been the most. We've not been the most most holy. We've not been the. We've we've made the mistakes that everybody else makes. Yet we still find ourselves where we are. 
What a glorious God. What a wonderful God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Grace is the exact opposite of legalism. If there is anything we take away today, it's the exact opposite. The, with the one you earn it until you get it. <laughs> with the other, you get it and then you learn it, how it works. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Does anybody have a testimony of grace? You know, just let's, we've, we've reached that point where, you know, everybody can share. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If I may just jump up from the last um, statement, the method of grace is totally opposite of legalism. Mm -hmm. uh, I just had a flashback by the grace of God uh, when I was pursuing my PhD. When we first went out after you finish your coursework, all the professors gathered and the committees, they told us this is an exclusive club. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to earn your way. Wow. And we are going to decide that you have earned it. Mm. So I began, I began the journey that took me five years. Mm. But the danger with you having to earn it is you may give up in the process. Mm. When the challenge hits, you give up. And I gave up for two years. I said, you know what? Why did I go for this stupid wow. degree in the first place? Who is making me go for it? You know what? I don't want it. Let them keep it. I didn't care how much money I've spent. I didn't care how much work I've put in and the sacrifice. I gave it up. And then guess what? When it was going into my seventh year, I got a letter from them that they were going to give up on me. If I didn't finish by a certain day, they're going to cancel me out. That's legalism. Mm. Thank God that grace is not grace like that. Over. Mm. Thank God, because then I said, oh, okay, let me go back and earn it. And by the grace of God, I was able to finish and graduate. But the danger that we face when we try to legalize Ten Commandments and all these other things, we lose souls that we were supposed to gain for Christ. People lose us if, people, if they legalize how we come to Christ. Mm. So I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. I thank God for grace. Great. Because if it's not for grace, I would have been forgotten about. Mm. I would have been lost. Yes, I was born to a pastor. Yes, we prayed and read the Bible every single day of my growing up. Many, many times, more than 90% of the time, we did it twice a day. Yeah. But that didn't save me. Mm. I thank God that I came mm. to saving grace of Christ. Because all of those things, when I look back, you didn't sing during prayer meeting, you get a knock on your head from daddy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Pastor Yemi, you remember, yeah. I know Brother Kola dropped off. Yeah. Well, you guys, I, I keep forgetting that I'm much older than you guys, and you probably didn't get the same treatment that I got because I was the firstborn. You fell asleep during prayer, you get a knock on your head because you fell asleep. Everything was Legal. in that process legalized until I found grace that I already had that I just didn't know that I had. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when you know the truth, the truth sets you free. Right. When you know you were born by uh, the uh, uh, the royalty of uh, the Buckingham Palace, mm. and you are a priest, you mm. conduct yourself as a prince. Right. As a prince, mm. right? You have the head knowledge. Mm. Then the application comes together with the head knowledge, mm. and you take action mm. and you walk in that truth, right? But if you were born in the jungle of somewhere by Prince Philip, and you never realized that you belong I to the house of blue blood. Exactly. You don't you didn't know that you can't walk in that truth. Mm -hmm. So praise God that once you know the truth, that truth indeed sets you free, then you live in your truth. And I thank God for the saving grace, for the truth that I know about the saving grace of Christ, because it has enabled me to walk in that truth. You give me $20, it's mine. If I don't pick it up, it doesn't matter. It's mine. <laughs> but thank God that I've been able to pick up wow. the grace of God, the saving grace of God, 
and I'm walking in it. Praise God. Why, why do we not pick up the $20? That's my next question. Ignorance. Why do we never pick up the $20? Ignorance. Somebody said, I, gave, I was listening to a preacher one time, and he said this little boy was adopted to the family of a, a millionaire. And, you know, the boy still acted as if he was living in poverty. And the father said, listen, you have all this wealth. You're going to inherit all this. Live, live, live like you own it already. It was difficult for this guy, for this young boy, because he didn't have the, the understanding. He you knew. Have renewed mind. He didn't have the renewed mind. He has not been transformed from mm -hmm. the poverty mm -hmm. from which he came mm -hmm. into this so lap, lap of blood zone. That's really the problem. The two didn't match. The action mm -hmm. and the knowledge yeah. did not match. But when they got married, when they were transformed, then you can live in your truth. Yeah. Glory be to God. Brother Frank, I see you nodding. <laughs> uh, guys, we know Jesus. He is the, the life, the way, the truth. Yeah. And all, all he wants is all of our heart. We were talking about thoughts and thinking. And, and if we only give God half of our heart, it is very difficult to not be deceived. Deceived in the world to be deceived is really easy. So with his grace, we just have to give him all of our heart. Yeah. That's it. That's how we can that's how we can check ourselves. Mm -hmm. Our thoughts, the way that we think, mm -hmm. right? The thoughts are gonna come, but then like you said, like an accountant, we're gonna do an audit and yeah. we're gonna think about how we're actually gonna process that thinking. Mm -hmm. And for you to always just trust in the word, trust in the words, a lot of times. If we're only, if we're only giving them half of our heart or some of our heart, we start being deceived by allowing things to come in where we think we can actually choose our God. We get to choose what kind of God we're, we're supposed to serve, but he's a gracious God. You want to serve the real truth. You want to serve the God, Jesus, right? Jehovah, he has so many names, peace, love. He's just, <laughs> he's amazing. He's done so much in my life. And what's even more amazing, it has zero pride now. That was something that I used to suffer. I had, a, I was deceived thinking that I got myself out of situations, but God put me in parts. Thank God, the Lord is so good. When I'm broken in pieces and tiny pieces it couldn't have been me him and his beautiful ways he carries me he helps me my family wouldn't be where we're at if it wasn't for his grace i would not be i, I don't even know if i'd be alive that's 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 how far that's how far off track i was at one point but because of his grace he got me <laughs> he got me to where i'm at and i'm still growing and we want to continue growing because why why not know him more yeah. every day we got to keep learning him more every single day we can't stop we want to get closer and closer and closer it's so easy just on your knees pray worship and just love on him because of everything he's done for you for me for my family for many people but there's just so many testimonies out there because of his grace so amazing and he just keeps giving it and giving it. So just, just submit, just submit. You know, I feel like we, we misrepresent God when we are of the mindset of legalism. Mm -hmm. and we don't have the understanding of grace. It's like I climb a ladder, okay? So when somebody else is trying to climb the ladder, I can get judgmental and feel like how many steps of ladder did you really climb how, how, what are, what have you really suffered and when they get to the middle and they are sweaty and tired instead of me encouraging them i'm beating them down and making them feel like what have you look at you you're just a joke and that is not the method of grace. 
In fact, I got to climb the ladder, perhaps, so that they don't have to climb it at all. So that I can make something easy for them. And if we're not really, if we don't have the mindset of grace, we would extend legalism to others, like she, um, Sister Yabo said, and will make life difficult for others. One. Number two, we become judgmental of others. And we make the grace of God or the, Christ, the cross of Christ of no effect in their lives. We're not making the cross of Jesus to make, to have an effect, the real effect it's intended to have. And when people become Christians newly, they look up to older Christians, right? They look up to other believers who have been in Christ before them. I think one of the issues we also have is that when the people who are in Christ before us are of the legalistic mindset, we tend to, we're under the internal narrative at that time as a young Christian that we don't know. So we just want to listen to people who know, right? And unfortunately, we begin to climb the wrong ladder of legalism. We begin to learn the wrong things. We begin to learn the things we are going to have to unlearn later in life. So it's just a chain effect, one thing after the other. And except we really come, to, like we've all said today, come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth is the only thing that sets us free. So how do I know that something is the truth? Not, and I'm not talking about my truth. I'm talking about the truth. Because two plus two is four, and it's not a tribalistic belief. It's not a, it's not that in part, my part of the world where I grew up, we believe that it's not racial belief. It's not that we believe that two plus two is four where I come from in Nigeria. And then people from Antioch, California, their, their own two plus two is five. And then when you go to Australia, their own two plus two is like 7.5. You know, no, it's true. That's the truth. It's that's not right. my truth. It is the truth. And that's what the Bible says sets free. The truth, not our truth. So if we customize the truth to suit our free disposition of belief, we likely, we most likely will not see the results. And then we're gonna wonder why, 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 and why, and why. And there'll be more whys in our heads. And that's because we are still oblivious of the truth. Brother Colladay, what do you think? You haven't said anything. Any testimonies of grace and legalism and how? Uh, let me just listen a bit more since I just came so that I'll um, get what yeah. you're saying more before I make my contribution. That's fine. If you would let me. So, many times grace gives and legalism expects. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Grace freely gives and the giving can come in different forms. Why legalism is like an expectation. Mm. You, it expects you to do this. It expects you to do that. You mm. should know this. You should work harder. You should do this. But grace continues to give and it's like a well that never runs dry. And, that, that, mm. and that is what is really humbling mm -hmm. about grace. That is the factor that, that makes grace really humbling because it's like a never ending well. It's like a hand that keeps stretching mm. and keeps stretching, but never draws back. Mm. And that is so humbling. Mm. I listened to a song by, uh, is it Lawrence? Um, okay. Diego? He, Diego? Yeah, he sang about trenches. Mm. And he was talking about how even in, in, the, in the deepest hole where he is, God not only saves him, but God comes right into that ditch. God comes right into that mess to pick him up. He doesn't all, only say, um, come, come, come up to me. But he says, he, he, he comes and he says, God, 
God comes to him in that trench, in that hole, and then picks him up. And that's that's grace. That's that's the amazing thing about grace because it it keeps giving. It never it, it never looks back when it gives. It's like a reckless giver. It's just like the reckless love we have from God. So that's and that factor is really 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 humbling. Because legalism makes you want to tick every box. Mm. You mm. want to have to, you just have to do everything right, right mm. to earn it. And once you earn it, instinctively, you have a sense of ownership mm. and you have a sense of entitlement to mm. this thing because it's so it. hard yes. to get it. But when you get something through grace, when you think about the process and how God came through for you, it's broken. It's re- that's why you can see the difference in the lives of people who walk under the legalism of under the legalism, under legalism and under grace. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's a very humbling process. And how do we, like you rightly said, knowing God, it's in, in the knowing, in the knowledge, in the knowledge of God. And I ask God daily to help me know him because that is the only thing that brings us to that point to say, God, thank you for your grace. Mm. Yeah, that, that's just... Sometimes the God that I know that I've interpreted is different from the God that he is. Mm. Sometimes the God that I've mentally constructed is different from the God that he really is. And I think that there has to be a transformation from him being a God of our mental construction to the God, to knowing the God that he really is. Mm -hmm. And one of the beginning points is humility. Mm -hmm. One of the very, very beginning points is to understand that we might not know as much as we think we know. Really. That we might not have things figured out as much as we think we do. And one of the things that fights against that is the more we grow in responsibility in church, being appointed pastor and deacon and elder mm-hmm. and all of that, mm-hmm. that is likely to begin to place a demand of perfect, false perfection on us. And that becomes a, a source of distraction even yeah. for us. Where it distracts us. You go on, please. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Uh, so, so all of those things that we do or that we allow to seep into our awareness mm. could be a distraction for us that we would then follow in the legalistic way yeah. and thinking that that's the way it should be. I mean, you said, you asked a question earlier. You said, so what is the reason why we don't pick up the $20 that somebody had already declared it ours? Yeah. And that's where I'm coming from now. Like, why? Why don't we pick it up? No, we are uh, allow things to seep into our mind rather than seeking after what we know already and getting to know it more. It's like you're going to a destination. There's a difference when you're driving to a destination that you know, mm. right? And a destination that somebody gave you a roadmap or maybe you have to rely on GPS. You've never really been right? there before, yeah. I see. You've never been there before. Either you've never been there before or you've never, you have not frequented the place that you know. There's a difference in the way that you drive to the place. So if I'm going, coming from Albany, I'm coming to my house. Regardless of where traffic is, I know where I am going. Mm. And I keep driving and I come to where I'm going. But if I'm going to a place for the first time, I get distracted. The thing that I mean, what I'm trying to express is the reason why we don't pick up or live in the truth that we know is the distraction that we allow. Mm. The distraction that we allow, and you know, uh, when you get all this accolade and you become the bishop, the the deacon, the the, the evangelist, or whatever. Well, not even by title, just by. Status just by position, people are beginning to look up to you, and you tend to want to live up to that. Exactly, the Sunday school teacher yeah. or the one that everybody thinks is all that holy, we get sidetracked. So I just wonder if that's one of the reasons why we know the truth, 
it's supposed to set us free. But we're not giving our mind to the transformation that is required so that we can live that truth always. And we seep into the, legal, legal, uh, the legalism of religion rather than the path of grace. I'm not sure if I made myself yeah, think, think One thing that really strikes me so much is you saying the example of going to a place we've never been before uh, as against going to a place we very frequently gone to. I think usually as a, as a baby Christian, as a day old Christian, you know, so to say, the, we're under the narrative that we don't know where we're going. We've never been there before. So we tend to count on what everybody tells us that God is. I'm telling you, we tend to count on what everybody tells us that God is. And God help you to be in the right place. Praise God. In the right people, in the right environment, praise God. But there are times that people are just unfortunately not in the... People are being sometimes under the feeding of half through truths. And half truths can be more dangerous than lies. You know why? Half truth is like when you put a little poison in a nice food. Is it good food? Yes. Is there poison in it? Yes. The fact that it is so nice and delicious does not mean it's poisonous. It's not poisonous, mm -hmm. rather. So the problem with half truth is that we see some truth in it. And because there's some element of truth in it, we tend to embrace everything. Of course, we can see this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true. But inside of the truth, there's also half truth, half truth. This is not true, this is not true. And the devil uses the strategy of half truths more than he uses lies. Yeah. Because he knows that if it's an outright poison, mm -hmm. it's black, mm -hmm. it's toxic, mm -hmm. you're not going to eat it. Mm -hmm. So he won't serve that in a plate. Mm -hmm. He'll prefer to tuck it in here and there in the meal and serve it. Because then, come on. How... It, won't, it will be so dumb to serve poison on a plate. He'd rather serve a meal that smells good, mm -hmm. but throw garnishes of poison in mm -hmm. it. And that's the danger. Mm -hmm. That's the danger. That's why we must search the scriptures for ourselves and let the Holy Spirit minister to us, teach us like the Berean Christians, when they finish hearing their pastor, when they finish hearing people speak when they finish from this Bible study, they go back and ask the Holy Spirit to interpret the word of God to them so mm -hmm. that they are not just running with things that they heard. They are running with revelation that has been revealed to them by God. Nobody is preaching their gospel. They are preaching the gospel of Jesus yeah. Christ. So there is no sense of ownership to anything that anybody preaches ever. Like, oh, Yemi said this, Frank said this, Kolade said that. No, it's not. It's the word of God. Seriously. We're just doing different verbiage for it from one preacher to the other, from one teacher to other. It's the, primarily the word of God. It's God's word. It's, it's God's word. And we are God's children. And we have the same access. The very, very, very same access to God, like anyone else. Any thoughts from anybody else, please? I just wanted to say that we were put on this earth to worship God. And the authority that was left behind is the God's spoken words the bible and it's so simple but we always try to complicate it yeah. That's right. for someone in grammar school just to understand the bible do not add yeah. and do not subtract anything from the bible 
adding is just a direct lie. That's just, those are just lies. And unfortunately, people will speak that. So this is why we don't, we don't, we always check people. We check leaders as well. Your pastor, you always want to check what they're saying just to make sure because it's your responsibility to worship God and to worship correctly, which is what the Bible has. And you're not always going to agree mm -hmm. with all the scripture, yeah. but that's what, that's, that's what obeying, <laughs> that's what obeying is about. That's what worshiping is about. Some things might not even make sense. There are some very clear texts to comprehend. There's some very clear texts to comprehend. And there's some other ones that you can't really comprehend, like <laughs> that God is the creator of everything. This is, this is outside of yeah. our comprehension. Yeah. He is the creator, right? As heavens is higher than earth, we're not supposed to comprehend him in full. We're supposed to get closer and understand his words and obey his words. But we, what happens is a lot of times we just want to find a God that makes sense to us. Yes, sir. We want to find a God that we can control. That's, that's not a God. That is not a God. That's true. That's true. That is not a God. So get excited when you don't understand something. Get excited when there's something that you almost kind of disagree for a little bit, but then you remember, oh, let me, let me get my thinking right. That is the God, the all-knowing God, the creator. Let me slow down and pay. Let me just worship and obey God. And it's amazing how we were talking about accolades, awards, and leadership. It is amazing to try to take credit because it is so exhausting. We think that we enjoy that credit. We think we enjoy those titles. We think we want to say, oh, it was because of me. It was because of you. No, it is such an exhausting thing. I've, I've, I've put my, I've, I've been in leadership positions and there were moments where I was deceiving myself thinking, oh, I enjoyed that credit. It was something that I thought I liked, but really I was suffering inside. I felt empty and people were following the wrong person. But once I said, no, this is all glory to God, that I, I didn't feel empty anymore. And I didn't feel, I didn't feel like I was carrying so much baggage because God carries all the baggage. He knows all. And we just give him the credit. It is so easy because we could all just say, it's because of our Lord. <laughs> it's because of the grace of Jesus. And, and, and it just takes so much energy off of you yeah. to just accept the truth to accept the truth and stop living in a lie mm -hmm. I, it's 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 just I, i've spent so many years living in a lie and it is exhausting no matter how many smiles no matter what no matter what my bank account looks like yeah. no matter what my network looks like mm -hmm. it is nothing when i don't have the holy spirit filling me mm -hmm. it is nothing I'm dying inside unless if I accept my Lord and my Savior. And when, when we're talking about driving to the right way or getting to the right destination, the text that's so clear is that I am the door. He is the way. Yeah. Just that's where you drive to. That's where you go to. Wow. And I just I just wanted to say that. But yeah, I man, all glory to God. Just it's so beautiful. His love is so beautiful. <laughs> Unconditional love yeah wow so 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 amazing it's so it's when there was a thought that came to mind when you were talking about what was it again i'm sure i'm going to remember but bottom line we there is no other way to know god than to know him for ourselves I think that's what creates all the distortions, you know, that we often have, you know, in the places of, in the process of knowing God. And the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is that he is a personal teacher. Mm. He is your personal trainer. He knows my needs that you don't know. He knows your needs that I don't know. And if I come to you and give you a recipe for life, 
that worked for me because of where I was. You might not be where I was at the time. And trying to use the same recipe may not work for you. Your needs are unique. Your needs are different. You know, our growing up years are different. The experiences we had growing up are different. We are wired differently. Our temperaments are different. So many things are different. Mm -hmm. And the only way to be able to get to the right decision, to, to the right destination, is to trust the driver, is to trust him as the driver. Um, I might not know where, I might not know the way, but I have a driver who knows exactly the way. He's been there before. So on the way to the path where, on the path to the place where he's taken me, he's been there. He's been He's been through that journey so many times. Now I'm in the bus, he's driving. Now I start to see things on the way that don't look like what I expected to see on the way. Mm. But that's when trusting the driver really counts. So he's taking me to the city of San Francisco, right to the heart of the city but I'm not going through Walnut Creek. I'm not going through Concord. I'm just seeing, all I'm seeing is woods and trees and everything in the narrow roads. I have the tendencies for me to begin to ask myself, are, I, are we still on the way to San Francisco? Because this, all I'm seeing right here doesn't look like San Francisco. But because I trust the driver, I know he's been on that path before he definitely is taking the best route at the moment that I don't know about. And that's where trust comes in. Is, is that song that your father, my father used to sing? Mm. Uh, he said when he finished at the seminary or when they were getting to the end of their course at the seminary, yeah. they were looking for placements. Everybody was getting all these placements with the big churches and whatnot. He said, he will pray that when is my placement going to come? Then he started singing this song that my Lord knows the way through the wilderness. Mm -hmm. All I have to do is follow. Mm -hmm. Or uh, uh, and another song is, um, uh, 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 you know, trust and obey. Yeah. There is no other way but to trust and follow. And then the last one is, where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I go with him all the way. So I just wanted to, you know, put that in that just follow the, you, you trust the driver, the pilot, the captain of the ship, just go in blindly and follow and just follow. Hallelujah. We are at the end of our meeting today and i just I, I think it's been a blessing really absolutely. i really I, I i just think it's been a blessing absolutely. i think it's been an awesome blessing i think that one of the ways we can make this linger is to go back to the thoughts you know and to go back to the notes that we make i always send an email um i'm going to send to you brother frank too where I put the link of this video, you know, that you can go back and just scroll to the parts, you know, that you feel like, you know, uh, blessed you the most and watch because it's always, always a huge blessing. One of the reasons is because what, one, of the, one of the strengths of learning is repetition. If I may say that to close, one of the strengths of learning, let me tell you what happens. I was listening to a cognitive scientist and he was saying that, look, Every time you listen to maybe a speech or a lecture or something, he was doing a graphic illustration that let's take the points where you are listening to this line and he would draw a line. And then the points where you drifted off to think about something else, one or two things, those would be like empty. And then when you get back to listening, the line continues and the parts when you drifted off, those are empty. When in the, for the five minutes, uh, 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 lecture that someone was listening to, they found out that it was just dots, dots, and lines, and lines, and dots, dots, and lines, and lines. That was a pattern that came out. Powerful, high impact lecture, but they drifted off many times, many times, many times. 
because they went to think, ah, it's normal, we all do it. We went, to, we, we go to think about ourselves, we go to think about our lives, we go to think about some, a friend, we go to think about the situation, and then we come back, oh yeah, yeah. But within that time that we drifted, a few things have been said that we were just hearing, but we're not really listening to. And when we come back and listen again is when the dots get connected. That's why you listen to something you're like, wow, I didn't hear that, oh, I, I didn't see that before. Like you're listening to a whole new message entirely. That's because you might have drifted off around that time, and the, what the person says something you really didn't catch, you know. And that's that's why it's important to to do repetitive listening. It's always always. Don't I really don't think that I've really listened to a message when I listen to it only once. No, that's for me just collecting information for my library. Now I've got to go chew it. Now I've got to go chew on it and digest it. You know, so the first time you really come across a message or a sermon that blesses you is not the time you really learn from it. The time you really learn from it is when you go back and listen and listen and listen and listen again. Thank you, brothers and sisters. God bless you.